Thank you, Tammy. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a tremendous pleasure to be back in Saskatchewan, here in Saskatoon. Merci, mes amis. I am, uh, I am really touched uh, by the welcome. Please sit down. We've got a, a good hour ahead of us uh, in which I very much look forward uh, to taking as many questions as possible uh, from people in the audience because uh, we know that we're all facing, as Canadians, an important choice coming up on October 21st. Uh, and part of the democratic process needs to be people uh, engaging, uh, taking questions, uh, giving answers, and talking about the choices we need to make, uh, not just at election time, but the choices we make uh, as a country on how we move forward, how we uh, build a better future for everyone, how we make sure uh, that we're on the right track on all sorts of different levels from uh, working uh, in partnership with indigenous communities and indigenous peoples to build a better future, to getting the balance right between growing the economy and protecting the environment at the same time. And one of the essential pieces of doing that is to make sure we have extraordinary people stepping up to represent their communities. And of that, Tammy Cook Searson is an amazing example, along with our other great candidates. I want to take a moment, though, Tammy, the fact that you've uh, chosen uh, after a uh, career of serving in your communities, of leadership uh, within, uh, within uh, your communities, uh, to step up and be part of our team uh, to move uh, not just Saskatchewan, not just Indigenous peoples, but Canada forward is extraordinarily exciting for me. And I think it's a, a recognition of the fact that politics can matter when you bring in the right people. Uh, évidemment, ce n'est pas une soirée pour de longs discours, c'est une soirée pour prendre des questions. Uh, J'ai bien hâte de prendre vos questions. Je soupçonne que ça va être surtout en anglais, mais si vous avez des questions en français, je serai très content uh, d'y répondre. I'm going to be happy to take questions in both official languages, and I'm going to try and get to uh, as many questions as I can. Uh, but we'll remember as well that uh, when someone's asking a question, uh, we deserve to give them respect and listen to them. And you may hear things that you disagree with, uh, either uh, when someone's asking a question or when I'm answering. Uh, but if we're all respectful for each other, that's how democracies work best. And I very much look forward uh, to that this evening. Well, uh, with that, I'm going to start with a question uh, from this section, and I'm going to work my way around uh, clockwise. So, does someone have a question uh, in here? Uh, you, in the blue skirt, blue dress, yes. How does it feel like to be a prime minister? <laughs> uh, one of the... Uh, great things about this job is I get to get out across the country and uh, do what I'm doing right now, which is have conversations with Canadians. And that's not something that uh, just happens at election time for me. Uh, I've been really pleased that over the past four years, I've been able uh, every year uh, to go out on a town hall tour uh, at the beginning of the year to give Canadians an opportunity to uh, express their concerns, ask me questions about where we're going and what we're doing. And uh, we're going to continue to do that uh, over the course of this campaign and hopefully uh, for the next four years as well. And that's my favorite thing about being Prime Minister. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? Yes, human. Good evening, Your, your Honour. Um, I'm Darlene Rose. You just call me Justin, it's okay. Okay, Justin. <laughs> okay, um, this is probably about the eighth time I've spoken to you on uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. and. I was in attendance at the final report and I uh, was very, very pleased with the volumes that came out and the two years of everyone working hard across the country. I was just wondering about the national action plan that was discussed and um, is there something coming down that we can look forward to? Because um, here in Saskatoon, we've been working really hard and the city of Saskatoon um, wants to work on those calls for justice and i just like to hear What's going to be happening? Thank you, Darlene. Thank you for that question. Uh, it is uh, a ongoing national tragedy uh, and has been for decades that too many Indigenous women and girls 
gone missing uh, and murdered uh, and uh, have been ignored or uh, not taken seriously as um, non-Indigenous women or girls would have been. Uh, and that is something that as a country we needed to face. And that's why we moved ahead with that national public inquiry uh, into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls who did uh, an extraordinary job uh, of uh, keeping the families at the centre of the work that they were doing. Uh, but getting out and talking to communities, listening to survivors, listening to uh, family members, uh, so that we could get some sort of justice for the victims, uh, give some healing to the families, and most importantly, put an end to this ongoing national tragedy. Unfortunately, we know, uh, like so many difficult issues, there is no simple one answer to this. And uh, the work that so many people have already been doing across the country is an important piece of it, but it does take uh, national leadership, it does take uh, investments. And we didn't wait until uh, the report came out, we didn't wait till the even interim report came out to take some meaningful steps forward on uh, fighting against gender-based violence, on keeping our communities more safe, on making investments in the Highway of, he highway of Tears uh, in, uh, in BC and other, uh, other places. Uh, but we know there's much more to do. That's why we have uh, accepted the calls to action uh, and we'll be working with um, organizations, uh, women's groups, leaders, and indigenous peoples uh, to make sure that we are fulfilling those in the right way to put an end to this ongoing national tragedy. Thank you for your leadership. Next question. Yes. Hi, Justin. Thanks for taking my question. Earlier today, you were questioned about how many times you have appeared in blackface or brownface. I'll make it easy. Is it possible to round to the nearest five? Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make light of the situation. I don't think it's something that we should be making light of. Uh, I think far too many people in this country uh, face uh, discrimination and intolerance on a daily basis. Uh, and what I did um, was inexcusable and wrong and hurt a lot of people who considered me to be an ally. Uh, and that is wrong. And I am deeply, deeply sorry. Uh, there is no, um, no way to sugarcoat it. It was something that I uh, did wrong. And I take responsibility for it. Uh, and I'm, sir, um, as we move forward as a country, as I move forward uh, and continue to try and continue to fight against uh, intolerance and racism uh, with my actions, I also take responsibility for the fact uh, that uh, I lacked respect towards people who uh, already faced tremendous discrimination, and that is something that I apologize for. Thank you. Uh, Next question. You, sir, in the yellow vest. Mr. Prime Minister. Yes, sir. I wanted to thank you very much, first of all, for attending in Saskatoon. And there's something that I wanted to tell you about. Please do not apologize. You were a teacher. You were teaching young kids. I would want you for a teacher. When you were young, you were in school. And please, when we have this debate, Let's not go back digging up bones 15 years. What are we doing now and in the presence? Like what's going to happen with Iran and all the rest of the country? Thank you, sir. I, I, I appreciate that and I appreciate the sentiment, but um, there was no excusing uh, what I did and I'm sorry that I did it. Uh, but at the same time, yes, uh, we do need to focus on uh, how we move forward as a country uh, on many, many big issues. Uh, but one of those issues is making sure that your leaders uh, don't hurt people who already face discrimination and marginalization too much in their daily lives. Uh, so I appreciate the support, uh, but uh, it is something that, uh, that I, I take very seriously that I did that I shouldn't have done. Uh, and uh, yes, I think people know uh, that I have been lucky enough uh, in my life to represent an extraordinary diverse uh, community in Papineau that 
uh, I that I work very, very hard to uh, make things better for, uh, that I fight against intolerance for, and uh, that's why what I did was particularly uh, unacceptable. But thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. First of all, I just want to say welcome to our, our territory here in Saskatchewan. Thank you for uh, the welcome name, to Treaty Chief David Pratt. Appreciate you coming to our assembly in May. Two quick questions, uh, but first, before I get to them, number one, I'll, I want to tell you I accept your apology. And um, <laughs> I want to acknowledge the work that you've done with us on child welfare. C92 has uh, been a game changer for First Nations here in Saskatchewan, particularly with the high numbers of our children in care. So I have a question on that. Uh, number one is, will there be uh, statutory funding coming forth for implementation on C92, which is the next step? Will you make a commitment to that today? And also, uh, the North of 60 claim for the Ask Athabasca Den in the North, will you commit to uh, reopen that and that support those negotiations that have been ongoing for 30 plus years? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, th thank you for your leadership. Um, on Child and Family Services, uh, we recognize, and I think all of us recognize, that uh, it does um, serious and long-term harm to remove an Indigenous child from their community, from their culture. And yet that is something that happens uh, almost on a daily basis right across the country. And that's why uh, working with uh, Indigenous communities, Indigenous leadership, we move forward on ensuring uh, that we recognize and empower uh, the inherent rights of Indigenous communities to care for their own children. Uh, that is something we need to uh, make sure that we don't just recognize, but make sure we finance adequately. And yes, it is a commitment uh, by uh, this government and by a re-elected Liberal government that we will ensure uh, that Indigenous communities have uh, the necessary funding and financing in a stable and predictable way to be able to offer uh, the care and support uh, for their kids uh, when they need it uh, to ensure that they are raised in their language, in their culture, and in their identity, uh, because that is a uh, fundamental right and of essential, uh, is absolutely essential. Uh, on, on the settling of land claims, on the way we're working forward, we've done that uh, right across the country. We've recognized that uh, many of these claims, many of these conversations have been ongoing for uh, years, if not decades, uh, and we've demonstrated a real willingness to sit down and work things through, whether it's interjurisdictional issues, whether it's uh, different communities that have overlapping claims, uh, whether it's just uh, a government that has dragged its heels for far too long on moving forward in real reconciliation and partnership, uh, I am committing to you that we will continue to work together and ensure uh, that we are settling the claims that we need to do in the coming years that are important to you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought there was too many rules here and too many people here for me. It's my bodyguard. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you, uh, Justin, for being here on uh, traditional territory of the uh, Treaty 6 people in the homeland of the Métis. Always pay your respects. And uh, my name is Mark Arkin. I'm the Tribal Chief of the Saskatoon Tribal Council. You, you piqued my interest uh, when you said uh, you'd answer some questions in uh, English and French, and, and, and I say to you in my language, Tanse, Nanaskamin, Kakil, I wish I could ask you a question in my language, but the effects of our people is detrimental. And the commitment that you've done to really ensure that we, we fix those problems is, is grateful. However, there's more work to be done. And it has to be serious work. And, and I think when we talk about Chief Tammy Cook and the work that she's doing for her community and the mental health uh, that she's focusing on, it's across the board. And I want to thank uh, David Pratt, Vice Chief, for bringing up the uh, Bill C-92. But I look at it in this perspective. There's a new CHRT ruling that came out. I'm asking that if this government is re-elected, that there's no opposition to that. Because we as First Nations people <laughs> need to build a future for our people. And it, it starts with an investment. No more begging, no more robbing, no more stealing. It's an investment to make things right. 
because we look at our incarceration system. How do we get some investments in there and really move forward to having our people have a quality of life so we can be part of this economy uh, as, as our rightful place as uh, treaty holders? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rick, for your, for your leadership. I agree uh, that it starts with investment. It starts with investments in the basics. Um, drinking water. Uh, far too many Indigenous communities across this country uh, are, have been under long-term boil water advisories. Can't trust the water that comes out of their tap if they even have water coming out of their taps. We have lifted 15 long-term boil water advisories in Saskatchewan, and we are on track to eliminating the seven that remain uh, on target before uh, the spring of 20, uh, 2021. Uh, that is a significant step forward. Uh, we also recognize that one of the fundamental building blocks of any successful community is investments in their kids, specifically in education. And when we came into office in 2015, the Canadian average was somewhere around two-thirds of the funding per student for Indigenous students that you get for kids in the provincial system. That gap is absolutely unacceptable. And in four years, we closed that gap. Indigenous students now get the same amount of funding, if not more in some cases, than non-Indigenous kids in the provincial system. But it's just a start. We've made real investments in housing, but there's much more to do. We've made real investments uh, in mental health, in, uh, in uh, fighting suicide, particularly youth suicide, but there's more to do. And I can't say for bringing up language. Language, we know, is one of the fundamental building blocks of culture and identity. And the fact that far too many uh, Indigenous youth uh, have not been given the opportunities to learn their language through residential schools that have broken uh, generations, through uh, cultural practices of a colonial government that minimized language learning. That's why we worked with Indigenous peoples across this country over the past years and are moving forward on Indigenous languages legislation that is going to invest and support Indigenous language learning right across the country in real meaningful ways. But yes, it's just a start. There's a lot more to do, but we will do it together. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for your welcome onto Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis people. Uh, next question. Yes. Hi, my name is Alexa. As you can see, I'm young. I'm only 19. Uh, I care a lot about the world, and I care a lot about the earth, and I'm terrified what's happening to it. My question is, what can we as a youth do to work with you in the upcoming years to fix that, to not just be one of the best in fixing the, the global problem, but the leaders, the biggest, the strongest, and the change. Thank you. Um, one, of, one of the best things about my job is uh, I gave myself uh, not just the responsibility to be prime minister, but I gave myself the responsibility to be Minister of Youth over these past four years, as well as Prime Minister. And the opportunity to work with young people and to be inspired by young people over these past four years has truly been uh, one of those uh, amazing learning experiences for me in a job, quite frankly, that every day is filled with learning experiences. Uh, being Prime Minister is, is always filled with new challenges. But young people, the way they are focused on not just you know, the next mandate, but the next generation and the next 100 years is an extraordinarily important thing uh, to draw on as a society as we shape the future. Because young people are naturally longer term thinkers. When you get to a certain stage of your life, when you're worried about, you know, paying your mortgage and orthodontist bills and uh, saving for retirement, you tend to think of the future in a more linear way, that it's an extension of the present. Well, young people are ready to imagine leaps and shifts and transformations of our economy, of our approach to, uh, to justice, of, our, of creating a better world and drawing on young voices and learning from them and being challenged by them 
and being inspired by them is a hugely important thing. And none of, none of the issues uh, that we talk about seems to matter more to young people uh, than the fate of the world itself and how we protect our environment. Because we know the choices we make right now will have a massive impact on the world 10 years from now, the world 50 years from now, the world 100 years from now. It is now the moment we have to actually act. We have to show leadership. And Canada is incredibly well positioned to show that leadership, to demonstrate what it is, to understand that we can create jobs and create opportunities for people while protecting the environment at the same time. And indeed, no one can pretend to have a plan for the future of the economy if they don't have a plan to protect the environment for future generations at the same time. So I need you as a young person, and I need young people across the country, and indeed, people of, young people of all ages across the country, to realize what's at stake right now. Unfortunately, over the past few years, we have seen from the Rocky Mountains to the Bay of Fundy, right across the country, conservative premiers get elected with promises to do less on fighting climate change, to do less in investing in a low carbon future to do less about preparing people for the changes that are going to happen in our economy, in our energy. And that decision that Andrew Scheer is leading on, this desire to make pollution free again, is a real problem. Because, well, here in Saskatchewan, the resistance of the provincial government, who's spending millions of Saskatchewan taxpayer dollars to fight pollution pricing in court, when what we're doing on pricing pollution in Saskatchewan actually returns to the average family of four this year just over $600 more than you will be paying with the price on pollution. So with the price on pollution we brought in in Saskatchewan, you are actually better off by 600 bucks. Next year, you'll be better off by over $900. And in four years, in 2022, you'll be $1,500 better off every year because we've put a price on pollution and prepared ourselves for a low carbon future. That is what conservative politicians are threatening to go back on. During the Harper years, their desire to focus only on the economy and not the environment actually didn't help the economy at all. They couldn't get pipelines built to new markets. They kept getting fossil awards because they weren't leading on climate change, and they didn't prepare Canadians for the opportunities that are going to come with moving towards a cleaner, greener future. I mean, the research into uh, CCS going on here in Saskatchewan, uh, the science that Canadians have always been able to put at their fingertips to create better solutions that we can then export to the world is something we should be taking advantage of, not hiding from. And we need young people to continue to step up and demand real action and demand a government that's going to lead on climate change. Merci. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Uh, I have my question is actually about uh, the government or the federal government give a lot of money to the scientific research and experimental development. But on the other hand, that's a lot of money for a lot of companies that are well established. Now we're talking about creating jobs and moving forward. So there is a lot of chances for small cottage industries, but the new businesses. Move, move the mic closer. Uh, there is a, a lot of chances for the new businesses to start up. Um, in different sectors. But it is very difficult actually to start a business if you don't have a lot of money because the government is not giving that actual support. You can start a business, but the bank rip you off anyhow. So what the government going to do to enhance uh, the small in scale industries and how do we help 
the new interview route to start the businesses and move forward, that will create jobs and employ a lot of people. And uh, I'm here with my kids. <laughs> yeah. Hello, and, kids. Uh, <laughs> he wants to be an engineer. He wants to be a doctor. And a question always come up. What do we do? Where would the government help us? Because you can start your own business. Because starting a business is not doing a job. You create chances for others. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for highlighting that small businesses are at the center of our economic success as a country. 70% of Canadians are employed by small businesses. We need our small businesses to succeed. That is why in uh, this past four years, we reduced small business taxes from 11% to 9%. We now have the lowest small business taxes in the G7. Uh, and that is a way concretely of helping small businesses. Uh, we've also... But we recognize the problem you put forward, um, that we need to be able to give small businesses a better chance on startups, on getting going, on launching. That's why, uh, just a few days ago, I announced uh, that a re-elected Liberal government will be creating, uh, through uh, BDC Canada, uh, $2,000, $50,000 grants every year given to small businesses across the country to be that seed money that is going to lead you to succeed. We know that Canadians are capable of being extraordinary entrepreneurs, extraordinary innovators, create great new opportunities, and uh, that is one way we're going to be investing in uh, 2,000 small businesses right across the country to create those opportunities, and BDC will uh, evaluate the criteria and make sure that the best and most promising companies get uh, those, in terms of startups, get those, that, those funds. But there's more to do as well, because we know that even small businesses are working in a global economy right now. And we're one of those rare countries that at a time of trade uncertainty and protectionism around the world, we were actually able to sign over the past three years, uh, four years, three of the biggest trade deals in the history of the world. Uh, our Canada-Europe trade deal, Canada TPP uh, with Asia, and we secured NAFTA at a time of unpredictability. But it's not enough to just sign those papers and sign those agreements. We need to make sure that our businesses, large and especially small, can benefit from the opportunities that access to more markets can give you. And that's why part of our plan for helping small businesses is um, empowering you to get the support and training to pierce into those international markets so that you are as successful as you possibly can be and your kids will be as well. Thank you. Next question from somewhere in here. You, sir. Not really a question, more like a statement. Uh, one, um, David Blakeney. Hello, Justin. Hello, David. Um, you have impressed me for years for doing just exactly what you're doing. Standing in a room, in the center of a room, and taking questions on any and every topic. That's what I feel it means to be a Canadian. Okay. And I thank you for giving the choice to me to choose forward. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, if, if we're going to be offering thank yous, I want to thank uh, not just you all who came out during an election time where people are thinking about politics, but over the past four years, the town halls that I've held across the country, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of people have come out on a random Tuesday or Wednesday night 
uh, to uh, a college auditorium or to a large hall somewhere to sit and listen to their fellow Canadians asking questions uh, and, uh, and a politician who's working hard to serve them answering those questions. And that is a democratic instinct that only really works when people are willing uh, to listen and learn from each other. And that's one of the reasons that I am so confident about the future of Canadian democracy and Can Canadians uh, themselves. So thank you. Next question. Question over here. Sorry, you in the back, sure. Hi, thank you. Hi, Justin. Um, my name's Shannon. Uh, thanks for visiting us in Saskatoon. Um, uh, my question uh, has to do with uh, science, technology, and education. So I very much believe that a prosperous nation and a healthy nation is one that invests heavily in science, technology, and education. And I'm just curious uh, what your plan is for that over the next four years. <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I agree very much with you. Uh, Investing in science, in technology, in research, and not just investing in science as an abstract concept, investing in scientists, investing in science students, investing in making sure uh, that more women get into STEM programs, investing to make sure that more indigenous peoples get uh, the pathway, the pathways to top educations. These are the kinds of things that we know make for a stronger country. But we recognize at the same time that we're at a time and an era in the world of so much change uh, that it can be really scary. That we know that our workplaces are changing, that AI is coming, automation and robotics, and uh, the skills that were developed in uh, universities decades ago, uh, or even just a few years ago, get very quickly out of date. And that can make a lot of people very anxious about their own future. Is their job, is their career going to carry them to retirement? Uh, is, uh, what is their kids' future going to look like? What are their kids' jobs going to look like? And that's why in order for a country to be investing in science as much as we have, we've invested more, while well, we had a lot of making up to do of 10 years of underinvestment under the conservatives that when we came to office, uh, but we've invested massively in scientists and science and research. But in order for people to feel comfortable about the fact that Canada is one of the countries that is leading the world on the development of AI, in order for people to not feel threatened by that, they need to see themselves in a science investing future, in a country that is unabashedly understanding the importance of technology and innovation in our future. That's why we created things like the Canada Training Benefit. That means that every four years, people are gonna be able to take four weeks off, uh, paid for, with a bursary of $250 a year that they can put towards training uh, regardless of their job, so whether they're working in a small business or whether they're working in a big company, whether they're unionized or not, they're going to be able to upskill so that they can keep up with the latest technologies and continue to be contributing and optimistic about their future path. We're also investing uh, in a broad range of supports uh, for families for post-secondary education to ensure that people can get the education they need to both see a scientific and technologically strong future and see themselves in that future in the same time. That's why we're gonna keep investing in science. We're gonna keep making sure that Canadians see themselves in a more scientific future. Merci. Great, uh, next question. It's got a question for me. You, sir. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much for being in Saskatoon. Uh, in addition to what David has already said, my name is Ali. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your policies. I moved here to Canada in 2015 as an international student. And because of the great policies that your government has put in place, I was able to land a job here in Saskatoon. I have been here for four years now, and I love it. I moved to Canada for the secure future, but when I mentioned the secure future, I can help but think so many people in India and Pakistan, currently at the verge of the nuclear war because of the tension in the Kashmir. And I cannot help but think about eight plus million people who have currently no access to the internet, to the communication, to the media. What 
can we expect from the Canadian government at the UN General Assembly that's coming up on uh, just in a week? And uh, what can we expect if you get reelected? How, what would you do to bring down the tensions between two nuclear powered nations? Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for choosing to settle in Saskatoon. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for your success. Uh, you know, they're, 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 we're in a moment right now around the world where people are worried about immigration. You can see a lot of populist rhetoric about needing to protect, uh, protect uh, our countries from people coming to our countries. Well, in Canada, we've always built success on people coming from elsewhere to contribute and build better life for themselves. That's been the story of our country, and we're going to continue to do that because we know that bringing in people from around the world who want nothing more, nothing better than to build a better future for their kids and grandkids in this extraordinary country is part of what has made Canada successful. And quite frankly, as other countries are turning away from immigration, uh, there is a tremendous opportunity to keep bringing the best and the brightest from around the world and contribute to our economy and to contribute to this great country. So thank you for choosing Canada. Um, the situation in the Kashmir is extremely worrisome. Uh, as you say, uh, the tensions between India and Pakistan are, are significant right now. Uh, Canada is working with uh, a number of our allied countries, our Five Eyes allies and others. Uh, we will be uh, part of uh, the, uh, the concerned group of, uh, of countries that are uh, encouraging de-escalation of tensions in the region. Um, we will continue to, uh, uh, to focus on that. I was uh, at the G7 in uh, France just a few weeks ago. I had an opportunity to speak directly uh, with uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, and express him uh, the concerns that I and many Canadians have about the situation in Kashmir. And uh, we're very hopeful that there is going to be a, a de-escalation in, uh, in the coming times. So thank you for your concern. <laughs> Next question from over here. Uh, you, sir, in the back row. Sitting down. Yes. Yep. Right. No. Right back there. No. I'll come to you, sir, next. But you in the yes. You in the beige jacket. Yes. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for coming here, and I really enjoyed your statements on climate change and working to fight that. Related to the global climate crisis is the global water crisis, which is often at the heart of conflicts such as in Kashmir and elsewhere. What are the plans for Canada to address that? regionally, nationally, and globally? Thank you, and that's a, a, a great question, one that actually uh, leading scientists here in Saskatchewan, both at the University of Saskatchewan and University of Regina, uh, have been uh, extraordinarily instrumental on in understanding uh, the issues facing um, water uh, across Canada and, by extension, uh, around the world. Uh, we know that climate change and the increase in extreme weather events is going to be uh, mean places where there is way too much water and other places where there is nowhere near enough water. And how we manage our water resources in Canada is going to be extremely important. Uh, that's why it was so disappointing that Stephen Harper had cut the, the PFRA, which was one of the uh, best resources based here in the prairies to uh, monitor and uh, pull together all the different scientists and actors uh, in uh, water protection, something that matters deeply, uh, not just to uh, businesses and industry uh, in Saskatchewan, but uh, particularly to the agricultural industry and to farmers. Uh, and that's why uh, we uh, are very much looking at uh, making sure we're continuing to lead and working towards uh, better water policy for Saskatchewan and elsewhere. Uh, we also recognize um, that the extreme weather events that are coming in is going to require a better investments in infrastructure uh, to stave off the negative impacts of too much flooding. Uh, and we're continuing to work with uh, with the province and with willing partners across the country uh, on green infrastructure investments that are going to make a difference. Uh, the two biggest investments we've been making as a federal government in Saskatchewan uh, over the past four years have been uh, around uh, highway extensions and highways and water specifically, well over $200 million invested uh, in various water projects, uh, hundreds of water projects, but we always know there's much more to do. Uh, but as we recognize uh, a world in which fresh water is going to be increasingly uh, uh, valuable 
uh, and needed in terms of management. Canada has uh, some of the largest freshwater reserves in the world, and we need to do a better job of understanding them, of uh, safeguarding them, uh, of ensuring we're developing technologies that we can sell and share with the world uh, to help people around the world with their water crisis. Uh, we often take water for granted uh, here in Canada, uh, and we need to make sure we're investing in the science uh, and the safety that are going to keep, uh, keep our communities, keep our country, and ultimately keep our world uh, better off in how we protect this most vital, precious resource that is water. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for being in Saskatchewan. I have a couple of points uh, I, I want to just talk about. Uh, first of all, I liked you since you uh, uh, you first uh, raised cancer awareness and you beat that uh, gentleman in the ring there. I forgot his name. But uh, it showed your fighting spirit, so I really appreciate that. Uh, I want to ask you uh, about the improvements for... Uh, uh, thank you for your last term, all the improvements. And basically, I hope to continue... I want to ask about the, uh, a couple of points about, one is the Isla Cross boarding school. I want to know if there's a settlement on the horizon with, a new, with your new government moving forward. And plus, I work on the front line of, of, of Métis-specific uh, addictions. Distinction, Métis distinction approach is working. Uh, we need more help. We want to do more. We need more help in Saskatchewan, particularly on crystal meth. And uh, so those are my two questions. Uh, is your go new government uh, that we form after the elections is going to work on Isla Cross boarding school issues and resolve that once and for all? And are we going to get more additional uh, resources for the challenges our families face for crystal meth? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, we are now working on the Isla Cross uh, boarding school situation. We will continue to work on it if we are reelected in partnership with uh, the affected communities and uh, with people. Uh, yes, uh, we are also going to be continuing to invest uh, in fighting uh, both the opiate uh, challenge that is devastating so many families and the crystal meth challenge uh, that is uh, particularly acute in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, that is why uh, we've made significant investments in things like uh, harm reduction uh, in uh, research and science uh, and support for frontline workers, uh, but there is much, much more to do uh, to fight and to support, uh, to fight uh, against addiction, to support people with addictions, uh, and to keep our communities safer and uh, keep people living longer uh, despite a, a, a real challenge of a crisis that is, is hitting hard in ways that are absolutely devastating for far too many communities. So thank you very much. You, ma'am, in the back, in the black shirt. Yes. Hi, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, I understand that this is not related to the area that we live in now, but I wanted to hear your comments to the, I feel like a group that would like to hear them, uh, related to your plan to compensate for the Grassy Narrows Mercury Crisis in uh, Treaty 3. Yeah, no. Uh, thank you. The situation in Grassy Narrows uh, is uh, extremely difficult and has been. Uh, there was a, um, a plant uh, that uh, expelled mercury uh, into uh, the water supply of uh, the indigenous peoples living uh, in Grassy Narrows. Uh, and uh, that is a responsibility that is both joint uh, federal and provincial responsibility. Uh, we have been working with uh, the community of Grassy Narrows over the past uh, months uh, and longer than that uh, to try and uh, reach an agreement because we understand how devastating this is. We want to support the people of Grassy Narrows. We understand uh, how important it is to make sure that uh, Indigenous peoples, indeed all Canadians uh, across the country, uh, live in safe communities uh, where they can drink their water, where their kids aren't getting poisoned. Uh, that is something basic for a country like Canada, and that's why we are uh, so serious about working with people from Grassy Narrows uh, to solve this challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. You. I am a huge fan of yours, first Thank of you. all. You're awesome. Um, so I'm going to start by saying, um, basically, I'm a single mom. I had a really rough life. I ended up on welfare, which, side note, that program needs a lot of work. Um, I worked incredibly hard to get out of the welfare system to become an award-winning photographer. And 
thank you. And, you know, ended up buying my own house and everything like that. So it was kind of a rags to riches story. Now, I know you've say, you say that you've lowered the taxes for small businesses, but I'm drowning in debt. Um, it's miserable. And at this point, after 13 years of being a published award-winning photographer, I probably will have to give it up. So my question to you is, will you hire me as your personal <laughs> photographer? Or, or, <laughs> or I would offer you a free photo session in exchange for a uh, payment of my accumulated government debt. <laughs> Uh, listen, um, if anyone out there is looking for an outstanding photographer, I've got someone to recommend for you all. Uh, no, first of all, thank you for, for, for sharing your story. And your story is one that, that we hear uh, people struggle with across the country, first of all. Um, one of the things that we recognize is uh, we need to do more uh, to support uh, single moms. Uh, we need to do more to make sure uh, that you have enough money to be able to raise your kids uh, at a time where the cost of raising kids is more and more expensive than ever before, which is why we brought in the Canada Child Benefit uh, as one of the first things we did uh, that actually gives hundreds of dollars tax-free every month uh, and, uh, quite frankly, lifted 300,000 kids out of poverty across the country and made a huge difference. Um, there's more to do, uh, and one of the things that we've committed to is we're actually going to be raising the Canada Child Benefit by 10% uh, for kids in their first year of life, because there are extra costs uh, when you have a newborn uh, that families need extra support with. And that is something that we consider uh, is essential to make sure not just that families have the opportunities to give the best present to their kids, uh, while they're uh, growing up, but it also ensures a better future for them all. Um, in regards to uh, your small business and your success and the affordability issue that so many families are struggling with across the country, uh, we know uh, that uh, investing in a growing economy, investing in Canadians is the right path forward to help people get out of debt, to help people create that opportunity for themselves, for their family, uh, to grow uh, their own success. That's one of the fundamental choices that people are faced with in this election. The conservative approach for 10 years was to squeeze, to create cuts, and at the same time to give benefits to the wealthiest in the hopes that that would trickle down to economic growth for everyone. Well, it didn't work for 10 years under Stephen Harper, and that's why we turned around and chose instead to invest in people, invest in communities, invest in the middle class, invest in support for families, invest uh, in support for post-secondary education, invest in the tools that are going to lead to greater success. Uh, you mentioned uh, the challenges around uh, buying your own home, buying your first home, uh, and affording housing affordability. Uh, is something that we move forward on uh, with investments of over $40 billion in a national housing strategy uh, that is making housing more affordable. And uh, regarding people who are buying their first home, we put in place uh, a first-time home buyer's incentive that actually gives you uh, up to 10% of the value of your home uh, off in terms of your mortgages. It's a measure that's going to allow more young families to buy their first home at a time where that seems to be delayed later and later, which has an impact on your savings and your equity. Um, so I certainly also can say that we've been investing uh, in the creative arts, uh, in the artistic community, uh, in uh, the work that so many professionals like you are doing, and we're going to continue to work to grow the economy and make sure that you're successful. Because if you need a great photographer, come and get a business card. Thank you. Next question. You, ma'am. Yes. Hi, Justin. I want to begin, well, first of all, my name is Sister Teresita Cambites, and I want to begin by complimenting you for your uh, uh, being so polite and humble. And I'm not saying that just because I'm a nun. I'm saying that because I'm a human being, and if human beings always treated each other like that, we'd have a very happy, healthy society. Thank you. 
Uh, my question has to do with the uh, Amazon rainforest. As we all know, the Amazon rainforest are the lungs of the world. They provide 20% of the world's oxygen, 20% of the world's uh, f fresh air. And we also know that there are fires burning and there's logging and ranching and mining going on. So I have a two-pronged two question. Uh, what will a uh, re-elected liberal government do to uh, protect the, uh, the Brazilian rainforest and the 30 million people, many of whom are losing their livelihood and their culture? And my second question is, what can we as ordinary Canadians do so that we can do our part? We don't expect the government to do everything. What can we do to help to protect the Brazilian, the Amazon rainforest? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your uh, lovely words. Uh, and thank you for your uh, commitment to uh, protecting our planet and making sure that everyone knows that, yes, there's things governments can do, but there are also a lot of things that individuals need to do uh, in our choices in uh, the way we make sure that we're protecting the future. Uh, in regards to the Brazilian rainforest, uh, just a few weeks ago when uh, the Amazon was facing the uh, biggest problems with fires. Uh, a number of countries stepped up uh, to offer support. Um, we were at the uh, G7 in France at that point, and uh, Canada committed $15 uh, million to help out, and more importantly, um, sent down or offered to send down uh, water bombers uh, and firefighters to help. Now, you may remember we've had some very tough years uh, recently. Uh, with fires, uh, wildfires in, in Fort McMurray in Alberta, uh, in BC over the past few summers. Uh, and when that happened, uh, we actually benefited from firefighters uh, from Australia coming up to help out in Canada because the seasons are, uh, are complementary in terms of that. Uh, Mexican firefighters coming up, people from uh, the United States obviously coming. And this is something that countries often are there to help out each other. And we were very much there uh, to offer our help, uh, not just to Brazil, but to countries uh, around the Amazon uh, with the support needed uh, as, as these fires were going on and, and of tremendous concern to everyone. At the same time, however, as you point out, uh, the challenge is more than just uh, fires at a particular moment. The challenge is around deforestation, uh, challenges around respect for indigenous rights and land rights uh, is something that uh, the world is very concerned about in terms of uh, the choices being made by the Brazilian government. And now we're always going to be uh, thoughtful about uh, trying to respect uh, decisions by uh, other countries in regards to their own sovereignty and the choices they make as a country. But there are also uh, international principles that Canada has always been very, very strong in standing for. And one of those uh, is uh, the rights of Indigenous peoples. When uh, I gave uh, the first address uh, of our term uh, at the UN, uh, I chose uh, to talk about how Canada has uh, taken on a responsibility to move forward on reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in a very real way. And it was something that, you know, at the UN, most people or most countries get up and talk about how great their country was. Uh, and I did a bit of that, but I also highlighted that, um, that Canada has an awful lot of work to do on Indigenous peoples and, and with Indigenous peoples on building a better future. Uh, and many other countries around the world do as well. So we have offered uh, our support, our partnership, our expertise, uh, and our approach uh, to countries around the world uh, to better respect and create partnerships uh, with Indigenous peoples. Uh, the Brazilian government is uh, particularly um, not particularly inclined to engage in that particular path right now, but we remain hopeful and we remain uh, part of a community of countries that is uh, attempting to put pressure on uh, Brazil to make sure that it's protecting something that, as you say, is a resource not just for Brazil, but for uh, millions of people, billions of people around the world who rely on, uh, on not just the oxygen, but the biodiversity represented by the Amazonian rainforest. Thank you very much. And I think uh, we have time for one last question tonight, and I'll go to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, there is an epidemic in this country that we don't talk about enough, uh, and that is the high suicide rates amongst our emergency services, uh, firefighters, paramedics, police officers, 
both career and um, volunteer. What, in the past few years, um, things have definitely improved. Uh, there have been more, um, more resources available and they've been easier to access, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, I recognize healthcare is a provincial issue, but what, as a uh, re-elected federal government, can you uh, continue to do? Uh, thank you for, for your question, and thank you for your support of our uh, first responders. Uh, they are heroes who put their lives on their line, their families' well-being on the line every day uh, to keep the rest of us safe, and uh, we need to make sure that we are keeping them safe. Um, investments in uh, PTSD support, investments in mental health support uh, for first responders is something that we have done, uh, but as you say, there's more to do. We also brought in um, a family benefit for uh, first responders uh, who uh, fall in the line of duty to make sure that their families will be well taken care of afterwards. That was something that first responders have asked for for a long time, and we're moving forward on that. Uh, we moved forward on that. Um, yes. Health care delivery is a provincial responsibility, but the federal government as, um, as monitors of the authority over the Canada Health Act uh, has an important role to play. And when we signed uh, the renewed health accords with all the provinces across the country, we made sure that we were sending money specifically and directly for the first time over $5 billion directly uh, for mental health uh, investments. Uh, and another $5 billion for home care, because these are priorities that we'd heard right across the country. Um, we have made significant investments in mental health, but there is much, much more to do. We know that uh, the situations our first responders often find themselves in uh, can be extraordinarily difficult and traumatic, and we have to do a better job of keeping safe those people who make sure with their lives that they, we are kept safe as well. Thank you very much for that question. Et merci tout le monde d'être ici ce soir. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It was an honor and a pleasure uh, to be able to spend an evening with you in Saskatoon alongside our great team of Saskatchewan candidates. Merci tout le monde.